Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOC course on Economics of Health and Education. In uh, lesson 2 of week 6, we will learn about public goods, private goods, merit goods, externalities and uh, what are the standard techniques for corrections of externalities. Now, in the last class, we studied budgetary functions of a fiscal policy wherein we studied that uh, public sector or the intervention of government is an important characteristic. Now, we also uh, studied that government intervention basically guides the budgetary processes of allocation, distribution and stabilization. So much so that allocation function, distribution function and stabilization functions are three important functions of the uh, budgetary process of a fiscal policy. Uh, we also studied that the public sector perception and the private sector perception of the provision of goods during the current period and the discount rate uh, is also uh, divergent from each other. Now, it is in matters of these that we require a formal introduction to the study of uh, uh, public economics, but since we are uh, studying about economics of health and education, we will um, uh, we will take a detour to get introduced to some basic concepts about public goods and private goods. So, um, keeping this in the uh, backdrop, in this lesson, uh, we will uh, study about what are public goods, what are private goods, uh, what are merit goods and how do we distinguish all of them from uh, each other. We will also look at an economic definition of externalities. So far in the course, we have been talking about information asymmetry, we have been talking about externalities in the health sector and the education sector. However, we have not had an opportunity yet to go into some of the uh, economics of how we depict the problem of externalities and how they are corrected in uh, the economy. So, uh, in this class, we will look at an economic definition of externalities and we will also look at correction of externalities. Now, let me uh, begin with uh, the three slides that we ended with in the last class. We uh, defined a public good as something which is non-exclusive and non-rival. Another term for non-exclusive that we commonly use is what is called non-excludable goods. So, uh, non-excludable or non-exclusive in the context of public good basically refers to the fact that no one can be excluded from the benefits of the good once it has been provided. Uh, the second important characteristic is that of non-rival uh, consumption, which means that consumption by any one person does not uh, exclude or does not uh, preclude consumption by others. It does not reduce the amount that can be consumed by others. So, uh, we also saw that many goods uh, that are provided by the government have public good aspects to them. For example, national defense or street lights, public parks, etc. We saw that there are not, uh, we sort of got introduced to the idea that there are not many examples of pure public goods except uh, maybe national defense uh, where uh, individuals do not um, directly contribute to the provision of national defense, but the governments contribute to the provision of national defense. And we also saw that a pure public good or a public good once supplied to one individual, it is simultaneously supplied to all. We also uh, sort of got introduced to the idea of a social benefit of a public good. The fact that a public good is simultaneously consumed by a lot of people together means that there is some kind of a common benefit that is derived out of a public good and we refer it to as a social benefit. But economists have found ways to depict these social benefits and social costs, which is what we will discuss in today's class. Then we, uh, in the last class, uh, we uh, depicted uh, this, uh, we showed you a diagram of a market value of a public good, where uh, the on the x axis we showed quantity demanded, on the y axis we showed price of the uh, good in question and we began with uh, two consumers A and B. So, uh, demand A shows the uh, demand curve of consumer A and demand B shows the demand curve of consumer B. But when we are looking at market demand in the context of uh, a public good, instead of a horizontal submission of all the quantities that are uh, bought in the market, we are looking at a vertical submission of prices or the valuation that the individuals are uh, making of the good that they are consuming in the market. So, it is a vertical submission of uh, A and B's demand, which results in what is called the market value of a public good. And then uh, we uh, got introduced to uh, a matrix 
which shows that often uh, the two characteristics of excludability and rivalriness is not a yes no question, but it could be a degree, uh, it, it could be a matrix of which shows the degree of rivalry in consumption, the degree of excludability and some goods may be 100 percent excludable, some goods may not be, but the degree of exclud excludability and non-rivalriness in consumption may be high or low and depending upon that we can think of goods and services in the economy which have publicness characteristics or privateness characteristics. So, we got introduced to these basic ideas. Today, we will take this discussion forward by uh, getting uh, to know uh, how the idea of public good, who came up with uh, the illustration of what is a public good and how do we uh, understand it in the uh, field of economics. So, uh, Professor Paul Samuelson in a 1954 seminal paper uh, titled The Pure Theory of Public Expenditure really came up with an explanation of how to uh, represent a public good in economics. So, he uh, identified the two main characteristics that we have uh, been discussing so far of how to define public goods. One is non-rivalrous consumption. Uh, this basically means that if one person is consuming a public good, it does not reduce its availability to others. So, if I am utilizing a public park, uh, I, my use of the public park does not reduce the benefits that another person B or C or a group of individuals can also take from the same public park. So, it is an economic good that is provided by someone, in this case probably the government, but my consumption of the good does not reduce the uh, amount available uh, that can be used by someone else. So, in that sense it is non-rival in consumption or non-rivalrous in consumption meaning that multiple individuals can consume the same unit of the good simultaneously without diminishing its value or availability. Uh, the second uh, defining characteristic that Samuelson talked about is non-excludability which means that it is not feasible to exclude um, others from consuming a good. Uh, um, when we say feasible, it basically means that since the good has been already provided and it is uh, prohibitively costly to exclude others from the utilization of the good, which means that once the good is provided, it is available to all regardless of whether someone contributes to the provision of the good or not. And in economics, we refer it to as saying that the, there are no additional expenses to provision of that good or the marginal cost of provision of that good is 0. So, if marginal cost of provision of that good is 0, then it becomes prohibitively costly to be able to exclude anyone else from the utilization of that good. So, Samuelson came up with these two main characteristics to define public goods, which is non-rivalrous consumption or non-excludability and these are the defining characteristics of how we want to understand public goods. So, we can explain also uh, the public goods and private goods with the standard utility functions of consumer theory. Uh, Samuelson considered a simple economy with a number of individuals, let us say n, and each individual having a utility function that de basically depends on the consumption of both private goods and public goods. And you can imagine that as an individual, often we can consider public goods and private goods at, as two separate consumption bundles, which means that we consume uh, as private goods, let us say a mobile phone, a book, a computer, a television, food, um, housing, transport, etc. And then we have public goods that we consume, let us say a primary school, primary health uh, healthcare center, or public roads, public parks and so on. So, utility function of an individual can be expressed as um, ui is a function of xi and g, where ui is a utility derived um, by an individual and it is a function of xi, small xi, which is referred to as the quantity of all private goods consumed by the individual i and capital G here is the quantity of public good available to all individuals. So, this is a simple utility function of an individual i who is deriving utility out of consuming two consumption bundles here, small x i referring to private goods and capital G referring to public goods. Now, how do we define uh, private goods here? Private goods are prior those goods whose consumption is excludable and rivalrous, which is basically the opposite of a public good, which means that if I am consuming a mobile phone, I have paid a price for it, which means that my property right for the phone is delineated by the fact that I have paid a price for it. 
and also the if I am using it, it is not available for somebody else to be used simultaneously. So, in that sense, it is excludable. The pricing of the good and my ability to pay for the good, my willingness to pay for the good has already made that good excludable from everyone else and also the fact that it is one good which if, if I am using it, nobody else can use it, it is not available for others means that it is also rival in consumption. So, each individual's consumption of a private good does not affect the consumption of others, but the total consumption of private goods in the market is a horizontal submission of all the individual demands, unlike the vertical submission of individual demands that we saw in the case of public good. So, the total consumption of private good must equal the total production. So, we have considered n number of individuals in the society or the economy and we have uh, x i private goods where i equals 1 to n. So, the total population of the country is uh, demanding all of these private consumption goods and all of these are equal to capital X which is the total quantity of private goods produced. Uh, this is how we depict a private good equation. In the case of public goods, we have seen that the consumption is non-excludable and non-rivalrous meaning simultaneously a lot of people are consuming the same good. So, if all individuals are consuming the same quantity of the public good capital G and one person's consumption does not reduce its availability to others, then basically everybody has a share in a G. So, we can depict it as saying that G is equal to G1, equal to G2 and Gn, which means that all the individuals within the economy are taking a part something in the public good capital G. Now, it is a different matter as to who is consuming how much of G or who is willing to uh, pay for how much of uh, G and these are very important uh, uh, valuation exercises in the context of public good and also uh, much of the problems with regard to the provision of public good arises because of the lack of uh, um, revealing of preferences by the uh, consumers as far as the public goods are concerned. However, that is not the objective of our lesson today. So, we will keep that aside uh, for the time being. But there are three important things that we discuss here. One is that the utility function of an individual can be considered as a function of two bundles of goods here. The first bundle being Xi which is private goods and capital G public goods and private goods can be uh, shown as a horizontal submission of all the goods that are being demanded by all individuals in the society. So, which is submission of small x i equals capital X which is the total quantity of private goods produced. This is the total good produced capital G is shared by all individuals simultaneously in the society. So, we can depict it as saying that capital G is equal to G 1 equal G 2 equal G n. Now, based upon uh, this uh, understanding of a public good, uh, Samuelson also uh, came up with an optimal condition with regard to provision of these goods which is now known as the Samuelson's rule or Samuelson condition. He derived a condition for the efficient provision of public goods and this is also uh, where we discuss a lot about efficiency and equity considerations in public policies or public economics. Uh, but to be very simplistically to be able to understand what is this concept of optimal uh, provision or optimal condition, here Samuelson derived a condition for the efficient provision of public goods where he equates the marginal rate of substitution for all individuals to the marginal rate of transformation. So, what are these two concepts of marginal rate of substitution and marginal rate of transformation? Very simplistically speaking, MRS or marginal rate of substitution of an individual, let us say I, basically tells us how much of a one good one is willing to forego for an additional unit of another good. And in this case, we have considered a private good and a public good. So, we can say that the marginal rate of substitution for individual I basically represents how much of the private good let us say small x i an individual is willing to give up for an additional unit of the public good capital G and this is basically shown as uh, the partial derivative of uh, public good to private good. So, this is represented as summation del u i upon del g which is basically the utility derived out of partial derivative of the utility derived out of the public good upon the utility derived out of the uh, private good and uh, the optimality condition tells us that a submission of this will be equal to marginal rate of transformation which is nothing but the 
cost of producing an additional unit of the public good at the expense of a private good. So, how many units of private goods have to be foregone by the economy to be able to produce one additional unit of the public good. So, these are the two important components of the optimality condition as far as Samuelson's rule is concerned. So, this is basically equating the marginal rate of substitution of all individuals to the marginal rate of transformation, but the marginal rate of substitution of all individuals here is considered with respect to the, uh, the amount of units of uh, private goods that can be foregone for another unit of uh, public good. And the marginal rate of technical substitution is referred to the cost of producing an additional unit of public good in terms of the private good. And this is referred to as the Samuels and condition or rule which basically ensures that the total marginal benefit of the public good is summed across all individuals and it equates the marginal cost of providing the public good. So, this marginal rate of substitution also helps us to come up with the concept of what is called the marginal benefit. This tells us what is the marginal benefit of the good to individuals within the society and the marginal rate of transformation tells us what will be the marginal cost to the society. So, it ensures that the total marginal benefit of the good is just equal to the marginal cost of provision of public good which then makes it an efficiency condition or an optimality condition for provision of the public good. So, now at this stage let us uh, first uh, summarize about uh, what we have done about public goods. We have understood we have gone a little more uh, into these two characteristics of uh, non-rivalrousness or non-rival characteristic of a public good and the non-excludable characteristic of the public good. We have seen that it uh, the definition of public good and private good can also be shown uh, mathematically as follows. We have understood the utility function. Uh, of an individual who is consuming both private goods and public goods. And then we understood that there is a Samuels and condition of optimality which is basically saying that uh, goods that are uh, the marginal benefit of producing a good should be equal to the marginal cost of producing a good. That is when we say that the good has been optimally provided or provisioned. And that can be shown in the form of marginal rate of substitution of all individuals substituting public good for a private good and that being equated to the marginal rate of transformation which basically translates to the marginal cost of provision of that good. So, with that now let us uh, also uh, look at this distinction between public goods and private goods in a uh, summary manner. So, what are the characteristics in with respect to public goods, uh, non-rival nature and non-excludable nature are the two important characteristics. So, in the case of public good, one person's consumption does not reduce the amount available for others, the quantity availability is not reduced. So, in that sense it is non-rival. Uh, then non-excludable because individuals cannot be excluded from consuming the good because the additional cost of providing that good is zero because the cost has already uh, been borne by someone and therefore uh, you cannot uh, exclude individuals from consuming the good because it is non-rival in nature. Although as I uh, mentioned in the beginning that one must bear in mind that it is often a matter of degree of excludability and rivalness rather than an absolute uh, yes no question with regard to whether a good is rival or non-rival or excludable or non-excludable. Uh, in reference to the two characteristics of public good then we have uh, the corollary characteristics of private good which is that one person's consumption reduces the amount available for others and individuals can be prevented from consuming the good because there is a valuation that is very clear. Individuals have a clear willingness, a strong preference for a certain good. They are uh, willing to uh, pay a price for the good and therefore uh, they are revealing their preferences for the good and therefore it becomes very easy. It is not prohibitively costly for individuals. Uh, to be uh, excluded from the provision of that good or from consuming that good. So, uh, therefore, private goods have the two uh, uh, common characteristics of being rival in nature as well as they can be excluded, individuals can be prevented from consuming the same good.
The second important characteristic then uh, becomes with respect to how these goods have to be provided. What is the efficient way of provision of these two goods, public goods and private goods? In the context of public uh, goods, we have seen that efficient provision will require that the sum of the marginal rates of substitution for all individuals be equal to the marginal rate of transformation or in other words, the marginal benefit should be equal to marginal cost and this reflects the collective benefits and costs of the public good. But in the case of private goods, efficient provision will occur where each individual's MRS will equal the marginal rate of transformation independently, which means that this reflects the individual benefits and costs. So, in the case of private goods, we are, the markets are mostly concerned about the individual's benefits and costs. But in the case of public goods, we are talking about the groups or the society's uh, benefits and costs. And this automatically brings in the, uh, uh, the importance of whether the markets can provide public goods efficiently uh, or markets should do with provision of only private goods and if not the market then who steps in uh, because we talk about welfare states, we talk about government intervention or government guidelines with regard to allocation, distribution and stabilization function, then is it that the governments need to step in for the provision of public goods. So, uh, these are some common examples that we take in the case of public goods and private goods. Uh, consider a public good like national defense. Each individual's utility function depends on their consumption of private goods and the level of national defense. So, the Samuelson condition would sum the marginal rate of substitution uh, of all individuals um, and equate this to the marginal rate of transformation. So, how much private consumption each individual would forego for an additional unit of national defense will be equated to the cost of providing additional national defense. Whereas, for private goods like food, each individual's utility function depends only on their consumption of private goods and the efficient provision condition would be that each individual's MRS between different private goods equals the MRT between those goods which will basically reflect the individual trade-offs. So, Samuelson mathematically differentiated public goods from private goods by focusing on their non-rivalrous and non-excludable nature and he derived the efficient provision condition which is known as the Samuelson rule or the Samuelson condition to ensure that the total marginal benefit of a public good equals its marginal cost reflecting collective rather than individual benefits and costs. Now, so far, we have understood the basic defining characteristics of a public good uh, and we have also because the opposite of public goods are private goods. So, we have also understood the defining characteristics of private goods. We have also understood the uh, Samuelson rule of optimal provision of a public good. Uh, and we have uh, summarized the distinction between public and private good. Now, often a related concept known as merit goods is also discussed in the context of public goods and private goods. And uh, this uh, concept, uh, this terminology was uh, coined by the British economist Richard Musgrave to describe goods that are considered socially desirable by the government and are often provided or subsidized to ensure broader access. There is a uh, expansive huge literature in the uh, domain of uh, merit goods, education and health uh, are in the center of this discussion and there are a number of uh, uh, papers that have been uh, written about the concept of the merit goods. Uh, and uh, generally, uh, we also talk about public goods as social goods. Now, uh, merit goods may be public goods, may be private goods. More accurate way of describing merit goods would be that uh, they may have publicness characteristics and privateness characteristics. It is best to imagine merit goods in the keeping in mind the matrix of public goods and private goods wherein we talk about degree of excludability and degree of rivalness. Uh, so, in that sense, merit goods are basically considered socially desirable. They are meritorious goods or goods that have huge positive externalities in the economy for the society, for individuals as a whole and therefore, they are desirable by the government and are often provided or subsidized to ensure broader access. And often it is found that merit goods, if not subsidized, are typically under consumed if it is left to the free market 
uh, for provisioning of those goods. Only people who have a willingness to uh, have an ability to pay for the good uh, come up to prefer uh, to uh, reveal their preferences about their good and then ultimately pay for the good. But people who uh, do not have the uh, ability to pay uh, will not be able to reveal their preferences for their good. Although the uh, benefits derived out of that good has huge uh, social implications and will impact and uh, positively benefit the society as a whole. And this could be due to lack of awareness, affordability or other factors. So generally merit goods are typically under consumed if it is left to the free market for provisioning. And some of the examples of merit goods include education, healthcare, public libraries, etc. And when we look at merit goods, there are three important uh, characteristics we could say. If we have to distinguish between public goods, private goods and merit goods, uh, like we talked about defining characteristics of public goods and private goods. Similarly, we can also talk about defining characteristics of merit goods. One of the first characteristic is that all merit goods have huge positive externalities, which means that they provide benefits to individuals and society as a whole beyond the immediate benefits to the individual consumer. Uh, so, for example, if I am accessing education, I am paying for, an, for my education, uh, then uh, it is a private good for me because I am paying for the education. Uh, but it also has some non-rivalness characteristic because my consumption of public education or uh, paid education does not reduce the amount available to the others. So, in that sense, it is a unique good. And also the fact that while uh, my payment of my education impacts me because I get returns from education, but because I am an informed citizen of the country and my uh, behavior, my social behavior can impact my fellow citizens positively. So in that sense, my education, although I have paid for it, I derive individual benefits out of it also has social benefits uh, for the society as a whole. So, in that sense, my personal education that I have received is also uh, providing positive externalities to others who are not direct beneficiaries of my education. The second important characteristic of merit goods is underconsumption, which we have just discussed that left of the free market merit goods are often underconsumed because individuals may not fully recognize or value the benefits of uh, these goods. And therefore, the third characteristic is incumbent that government intervention is required to correct for underconsumption. Governments often intervene by providing these goods directly or subsidizing the provision of those goods. And there are many examples and the most common examples that I have been taking as a part of this course is education, healthcare. People, uh, you know, education provides individual benefits like better job prospects and higher income, but also societal benefits like reduced crime rates and a more informed citizenry. Similarly, healthcare improves individual health and productivity, but also reduces public health risks and ensures healthier workforce. Public libraries, for example, can also be considered as an example of a merit good, which enhances individual knowledge and literacy, but also contributes to a more educated and capable society. Okay, uh, let us also now uh, spend a little time on how do we distinguish between public goods and merit goods then. So, public goods uh, are non-rivalrous, non-excludable. Merit goods can be rivalrous and excludable, but they are subsidized or provided by the government because their benefits are undervalued by individuals. For example, education and health care because governments uh, invest a lot on primary uh, education, secondary education, uh, vocational education, skill based education and so on because although uh, these can be excludable, not exactly rival, but they can be excludable, but they are subsidized or provided by the governments because their benefits are undervalued by individuals A or they have huge positive externalities for the society as a whole in the long run in terms of better employment opportunities, better economic growth and development and so on. We can also distinguish between private goods and merit goods. Private goods we know are rivalrous and excludable. They are consumed based on individual preferences and purchasing power. But merit goods, despite being potentially rivalrous and excludable, are provided or subsidized to ensure broader access due to their positive externalities. And vaccinations is an important example in the context of uh, merit goods. 
that are private goods that are uh, both excludable and rival in nature because if I have consumed my vaccination then it is not available for anyone else but the benefits that I draw out of my vaccination can positively impact someone else from getting uh, protection from uh, let us say an infectious disease. So, in that sense my consumption of a um, uh, private good uh, has a social merits of protecting someone else from, um, from a disease. So, in that sense it is a merit good which would require government intervention. Okay, so far in this lesson we have um, learnt about public goods and private goods. We have also seen that there is uh, usage of merit goods and we tried to distinguish between all of these concepts. And there are two important characteristics that come out distinctly. One is rival or non-rival consumption of goods and second is excludable or non-excludability of goods. Now, the, because of these two important defining characteristics of good, we often come face to face with a phenomenon what, which is referred to as market failure and uh, because of these two important uh, characteristics we often come up with the concept of what is we, we come face to face with what is referred to as externalities in the market and because of externalities we may it may result in some kind of a market failure. Now, let us spend some time over this. There can be two important reasons uh, of market failure. The first is market failure due to non-rival consumption and the second is market failure due to non-excludability of a good. So, we have uh, spent some time over the non-rival characteristics and we have seen that exclusion is often inappropriate or not possible in the case of public goods because their consumption is non-rival when A is consuming a good and A gets benefits out of uh, consumption benefits out of that good, it does not hurt B uh, and therefore, the exclusion of A would be inefficient and efficient resource use requires that uh, the price or the benefit equal marginal cost. But in this case, we have seen that marginal cost of uh, providing an additional good or the cost of admitting an additional user to take uh, benefit of that good is 0 and therefore, the price should be 0. But often the cost has uh, already been uh, taken care of. So, even though the marginal cost of admitting an additional user is 0, the total cost of providing the facility is not 0, although the marginal cost of providing the facility is 0 and this cost needs to be covered somehow and that must be determined by how large a facility should be provided. So, under these conditions when exclusion is not possible or it is inappropriate uh, even if it is feasible, this task cannot be performed through the usual market mode of uh, selling uh, products to individual consumers and this is where we say uh, that the markets fail or we uh, experience market failure. So, if we have to come up with a definition of market failure due to non-rival consumption then we can say that it is a process of provision through the market cannot function and therefore, a political process of budget determination becomes necessary which is a process which uh, permits consumers to express their preferences through the political process and also obliges them to contribute. So, uh, market failure can be explained as a process of failure where the markets cannot function and therefore, the political process of budget determination has to set in, it becomes necessary and therefore, it is a process which allows the consumers to reveal their preferences through the budgetary process or the political process and then it obliges them to contribute to the provision of this good or service and this obligation of contributing to the budgetary process or the political process of budget policy, fiscal policy is mostly uh, uh, happens through the mode of taxation or taxing of individuals. So, this is uh, so this is one of the reasons why markets fail uh, which directly comes from the uh, defining characteristic of public good which is non-rival consumption. A second reason as I just mentioned could be due to non-excludability again a defining characteristic of public good. So, this happens markets fail when consumption is rival, but exclusion may not be uh, possible or feasible. So, most goods which are rival in consumption can actually be excluded, but uh, for example, if you are traveling on a crowded street during rush hours and the use of the available space is distinctly rival and exclusion uh, would be efficient, 
and should be applied, often it is possible to uh, impose a tax or user fee on people to be able to use uh, these kinds of public facilities. But um, although it is possible, it may not be deemed uh, uh, feasible or ethical to be able to do so. You can also think of building lifts and hospital lifts, etc., where uh, crowding can lead to rivalness of space uh, available. But often it is uh, unethical to drive out people from the use of these uh, public goods or social goods for the benefit of one's own. So, exclusion would be impossible and often exclusion is impossible and also uh, administration of the exclusion is uh, difficult or it is also very costly to exclude people from uh, utilizing the benefits of those, these goods. When we are dealing with a situation in which exclusion should be applied, but it is not possible, then we also uh, face the uh, phenomenon of what is called market failure. So, public provision is required until techniques can be found to apply exclusion. So, market failure basically takes place when um, it becomes prohibitively costly for people to be able to exclude people from utilizing a certain good or uh, maybe because it is non-rival in nature and therefore it is not feasible or possible to uh, uh, exclude people from utilization of those goods. And when such a situation happens, often markets are not able to efficiently provide these uh, goods uh, to individuals and then we face uh, uh, what is called market failure. So, it could be due to non-rival nature of public goods, it could be due to the non-excludability nature of public goods or it could be due to both of these natures and also the degree of uh, excludability or non-excludability and the degree of non-rivalness will tell us what is the size of the market failure that we are faced with. And a related concept of market failure is what we often refer to as externalities in economics. Uh, market failures take place because of externalities. Externalities take place because of the defining characteristics of public goods which is non-rival and uh, non-excludability. So, if we have to come up with a definition of what are externalities, they are basically the effects of a decision on a third party that are not taken into account by the decision maker. So, for example, if I am a smoker, uh, I purchase uh, a good and um, it provides me some kind of utility although it is an economic bad uh, and should not be encouraged. So, it gives me some utility and it may also uh, lead to uh, smoke uh, in my immediate vicinity and uh, another individual may be negatively impacted by it which is a case of negative externality here. So, the here the person who is buying the good is uh, the uh, second party, the person who is selling the good is the first party, but the person who is passive smoking is the third party. So, externalities are the effects of a decision on a third party that are not taken into account by the decision maker and often when these impact on third party are negative in nature or leads to economic bads, we refer it to as negative externality because it is considered detrimental to others. So, for example, secondhand smoke, carbon monoxide emissions, etc., are uh, pollution, etc., are referred to as negative externalities. The positive externalities on the other hand uh, can also take place. I have taken the example of vaccination often in this course that uh, the first and the second party if I am buying a vaccine and I am utilizing for myself and if the benefits of my vaccination impacts a third person positively then in that case it is a positive externality. So, positive externalities occur when the effects are beneficial to others. Uh, I would encourage the learners to come up with many, many more examples of positive and negative externalities on their own. So, now another um, important term that we must introduce at this point is we have often referred to marginal cost, but in the context of uh, public goods or uh, positive and negative externalities, we bring in the concept of social cost or social benefit. When we talk about uh, cost, we talk about uh, in the context of private goods, we often refer to private costs and private benefits or what is the cost that accrues to me as an individual when I am trading in the market or what is the benefit that accrues to me when I am buying a good. 
So, in that sense we refer to private costs and private benefits, but when we are uh, factoring in the uh, existence of uh, positive and negative externalities, we have to be concerned about the third parties which basically is the rest of the society. So, in that sense we are looking at not just private cost or private benefit, we also want to look at social benefit and social cost and this is what we will uh, discuss in this last part of today's lesson. When there are negative externalities, the marginal social cost differs from the marginal private cost. Uh, when there are uh, negative externalities, if we factor in the negative externalities uh, to the total cost of production of a good, then we would see that the overall cost after factoring in social cost is much higher than the total private cost that the individual was facing earlier. So, in this case the marginal social cost includes the marginal private cost of production plus the cost of negative externalities associated with that production and we can refer it to as the all the marginal costs that the society bears and we give it the term uh, referred to as marginal social cost. So, let us try to understand this with the example of this interactive figure here. Let us say that we are beginning with a situation in the market where there are no externalities. This is a standard demand and supply uh, curve and this is the equilibrium quantity demanded Q0 and the equilibrium price is uh, P0. But let us say that some externalities exist in this market uh, because of some reason and uh, now instead of S0 which was the marginal private cost, we have also factored in the cost of externality and we are faced with a new uh, social cost or marginal cost referred to as the marginal social cost. Now, we know that uh, the intersection of the demand and supply curve gives us the equilibrium quantity and price demanded. In the previous case, we were at Q0 and uh, P0 which was the point of intersection of the uh, demand curve, the social demand curve and the uh, private cost curve. But now that we have seen that the total cost to the society is much higher than the private cost, uh, which also means that the marginal social cost is higher than the marginal private cost and we are faced with a new uh, marginal social cost, we will see that it leads to we need to come up with new uh, quantity demanded and uh, price to be paid for the uh, good in question here. So, we will see that the equilibrium price has now, if we look at the new intersection point, we will see that the equilibrium quantity demanded has now reduced to Q1 and the price to be paid by the individuals has increased to P1. So, this is a case of uh, factoring in uh, cost of externality and how does the factoring in of costs of externality takes place This mostly happens uh, through government intervention which may be necessary to reduce production and understand here that we are talking about negative externality or costs of externalities uh, which means that the allocation is much higher than what it should have been. The allocation is Q0 but the allocation should be Q1 after factoring in for negative externalities and also that the price paid for one unit of the good should also be higher and therefore, instead of paying P0, uh, the individual should be paying P1 here. So, if there are externalities, the marginal social cost differs from the marginal private cost and P0 is too low and Q0 is too high to maximize uh, social welfare. So, that is an example of a negative externality. Similarly, we can talk of a positive externality. This happens uh, when the marginal social benefit differs from the marginal private benefit. So, as I said vaccination is an example of uh, public good which has huge positive externalities and therefore, marginal social benefit is also high. So, this marginal social benefit then includes the marginal private benefit of consumption plus the benefits of positive externalities resulting from consuming that good and thus it includes all the marginal benefits that the society receives. We can understand that with the help of a similar kind of an example. Let us say we begin at this point of intersection here where, where there are no externalities and P0, Q0 are the equilibrium price and quantity. Uh, we have marginal private benefit curve here D0 and we have the marginal private cost here uh, uh, shown as a supply curve. 
Now, if there are externalities, which means that there are more benefits that are derived by the society as a whole than just private benefits accruing to the individual, then we will have a new uh, social benefit curve or a demand curve, which is higher than the uh, earlier D0 curve. And this basically shows that the P0 and Q0 are too low to maximize social welfare, because then we should be consuming at the new intersection point here, the quantity demanded should also increase and the price paid by the individual should also increase. And this, uh, the objective is to increase quantity demanded because there are huge benefits of uh, um, the uh, social benefits of consuming that good is very high, but then somebody has to pay a price for that increased consumption of the good and mostly it is the governments that step in to increase consumption because this can be a case of a uh, merit good or a social good which has uh, a private good which has merit characteristics or public characteristics and so on. So, government intervention may be necessary to increase consumption here. So, these are some of the methods of dealing with externalities. Direct regulation is one of the most important ways of in which governments directly limit the amount of a good uh, people are allowed to use. For example, you have uh, let us say uh, carbon taxes, pollution certificates and so on and so forth. Incentive policies, uh, there are tax incentives in which we use a tax to create incentives for individuals to structure their activities which is consistent with social objective, socially desirable uh, objectives. Uh, there are market incentives that require market participants to certify that they have reduced total consumption by a certain amount. Subsidies are one of the most important ways to correct or internalize positive externalities. This is another term which is frequently used which is called internalization of positive and uh, negative externalities and of course, there are voluntary solutions as well for uh, dealing with externalities. For example, uh, to reduce pollution in a given period of time in a year when we follow odd even car numbers for uh, uh, transportation etcetera are all voluntary solutions that can be utilized to reduce the um, production of the economic bad let us say. So, the same diagram here uh, where we are looking at marginal social benefit, marginal private cost and marginal social uh, cost. This is to show that when we want to internalize the externality, it is usually in the form of a, a tax. Uh, for example, a tax on pollution that equals the social cost of the negative externality will cause individuals to reduce the quality, uh, quantity of pollution causing activity to uh, Q1, which is the socially optimal level of uh, production of that good uh, and uh, the uh, tax uh, amount will also increase the price uh, to P1. So, one of the examples of uh, a tax on pollution is effluent fees which are charges imposed by governments on the level of pollution uh, created. A market incentive plan is similar to direct regulation uh, which is in the amount of the good consumed is reduced. A market incentive plan differs from direct regulation because individuals who reduce consumption by more than the required amount receive some marketable certificates that can be sold to others. Uh, these are in practice in many countries across the world. Incentive policies are also seen to be more efficient than direct regulatory policies. Uh, voluntary reductions allow individuals to choose whether to follow what is socially optimal or what is privately optimal and the socially conscious people will often become discouraged uh, if they believe that a large number of people will free ride and this is something that we see in the case of insurance markets as well. We have discussed some of these issues in the context of moral hazard. Uh, in uh, uh, the case of insurance markets. Free rider problem is individuals unwillingness to share the cost of a public good. These are all very important areas of interventions in the discipline in the stream of public economics. However, uh, we, we will uh, not take these up in detail in this course. Now, in the last part of this uh, lesson, let me also uh, look at let us also look at some depictions of uh, how we understand optimal policy. We have already understood the Samuelson condition or Samuelson's rule and uh, based on that we could define an optimal policy as one in which the marginal cost equals the marginal benefit of that policy. Another way of saying is that an optimal policy is a policy in which the marginal cost of undertaking that policy is equal to the marginal benefit of that policy. 
So that is to say that the resources are being wasted if a policy is not optimal. But here uh, remember that when we are saying optimal uh, policy or uh, for example, let us say what is the optimal level of pollution that should be acceptable by the society, we are not really talking about uh, optimal level of pollution as zero pollution, but the amount where the marginal benefit of reducing pollution equals the marginal social cost, which is what we have seen that in the case of negative externalities. Uh, consumption, there is a tendency to over consume or over produce and it needs to be uh, brought down by the form of taxes. Similarly, in the case of uh, uh, positive externalities, we have seen that there is a tendency to under consume or under produce and therefore, it, the production and consumption needs to be increased because it has huge social benefits and that is usually provided by the government through the uh, instruments of subsidies and uh, so on and so forth. So, if you look at uh, this figure here, this figure shows us the um, usual uh, quantity demanded on the horizontal axis and price of the good on the vertical axis. The demand curve D1 shows us A's, uh, let us say individual A's willingness to pay for a good. This is uh, D2 shows us the individual uh, B's willingness to uh, pay for the good. And then we have the market uh, value of the public good, which is uh, basically vertical addition and it shows us the collective willingness to pay. Now, the public good uh, marginal cost is shown by the upward sloping supply curve S here and the intersection of uh, DC and S basically tells us what is the optimum amount of the public good. This is the point where marginal benefit is equal to marginal cost. And based upon the cost benefit analysis, uh, the marginal cost is equal to marginal benefit rule. We often talk about uh, externalities also as spillover costs. So, negative externalities are referred to as uh, spillover costs and this leads to over allocation or over production of a good or over consumption of a good. Similarly, positive externalities are referred to as spillover benefits and it leads to under allocation, under consumption or under production of a good. And uh, we can show uh, spillover uh, costs in similar manner as we have discussed so far, marginal social cost and uh, the, the difference between the private cost and the marginal social cost uh, gives us the spillover costs. And we have seen that when there are spillover costs, there are over allocation of goods and this over allocation can, can be corrected with the help of government intervention. So, when we correct for uh, spillover costs, often uh, we talk about taxation or taxes and uh, remember that we are talking about uh, tax as a fiscal policy here, which is why we discussed in the last class the fiscal functions of a budget policy. So, over allocations in the market are usually corrected with the help of uh, taxes. Similarly, in the context of uh, spillover benefits, uh, we uh, talk about um, under allocation of uh, good and under allocation of goods can be corrected with the help of subsidies, but the subsidies can be provided to consumers as well as to producers. When we provide a subsidy to uh, consumers, we are basically asking them to increase their demand. So, it is referred to as consumer subsidy and a consumer subsidy can lead to correction of under allocation by increasing the demand of the good by the consumer because there may be a price subsidy, there may be a quantity subsidy. Uh, either way, uh, the subsidy to the consumer can lead to increases in demand for the good because it has social benefits and that is how under allocation can be corrected. We can also have uh, correction of under allocation by providing subsidy to uh, producers also referred to as a producer subsidy, which can also lead to correction of under allocation. So, there can be producer subsidy, there can be consumer subsidy, uh, which can correct for spillover benefits. When a producer gets a subsidy, they uh, then uh, tend to uh, increase production of the good, which has merit characteristics. And the difference in cost is borne by the government by providing subsidy to the uh, producers. So, um, in this class, we have uh, been introduced to uh, a few important concepts in uh, economics, which are central to the understanding of health and education as unique goods. 
we uh, got introduced to public goods, we saw the distinction between public goods and private goods, we saw how Samuelson described public goods um, and uh, the utility function of public goods and private goods. We also saw a distinction of public goods, private goods vis-a-vis -vis merit goods and uh, we saw that the two important characteristics of public goods helps us uh, determine uh, the uh, externalities and externalities give rise to market failure and the market failure uh, gives rise to the intervention of the public sector or the government and uh, the intervention of uh, government uh, can be in the form of different kinds of corrections depending upon whether there are spillover costs or spillover benefits. When there are spillover costs, often we take the route of taxes, when there are spillover benefits, we take the route of subsidies. But these are just very basic and um, preliminary introduction to the concept of market failure and public goods. There are very many uh, mechanisms and instruments through which corrections take place or there are very many ways in which corrections are not able to take place. It is a different area of analysis altogether. However, I will sort of summarize this discussion in the context of our course where we can say that understanding these market failures and externalities justifies various forms of government intervention particularly in the context of health and education sector. How? By three modes, one is subsidies and public provision to ensure broad access and address under consumption. Governments may subsidize or directly provide healthcare and educational services. There can be regulation, governments can regulate to correct information, asymmetry, ensure quality standards and protect public health. There can be incentives, financial incentives or penalties that can be used to encourage behaviors that generate positive externalities. Example, tax credits for education, subsidies for vaccinations and so on. With this, I will end today's class. But before I go, let me show you a few references that interested learners can take up for further studies. Um, one is uh, the seminal paper by Paul Samuelson, the, public, the Pure Theory of Public Expenditure, uh, published in the Review of Economics and Statistics. It could be available uh, to many of you online. Similarly, um, William Oakland's Theory of Public Goods from the Handbook of Public Economics. There are two textbooks that I would uh, strongly recommend uh, beginners uh, to uh, study uh, Hendricks and uh, Gareth Miles' Intermediate Public Economics. Uh, there is an older book by Gareth Miles on public economics and this will give a very good introduction to an interested student of uh, public economics who wants to be introduced to the to uh, in-depth or more analysis on public and private goods and so on and so forth. And there are many examples that are taken for education and health sector as well. I would also like to um, introduce the learners to a web resource of na the National Bureau of Economic Research, uh, the public economics page where there are many uh, general articles that are written by renowned authors all over the world and which will be useful to the learners of this course. Uh, with this, uh, thank you. Mm -hmm.